Welcome back, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Vijay Vaitiswaran. I'm the Global Energy and Climate Innovation Editor at The Economist, and I'm coming to you live from the Global Conference on Energy and AI, hosted by the International Energy Agency in Paris. I've been moderating a series of conversations with leading figures from government, business, technology, and civil society on how artificial intelligence could affect energy and the world economy in the years ahead. I'm here now with Pankaj Sharma, who is Executive Vice President for Secure Power at Schneider Electric. Welcome, Pankaj. Thank you. Uh, let's get right to the heart of it. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the last couple of days about how AI affects energy, how energy affects AI, but really, the, the toughest challenge, the nut we have to crack is that AI is using and will use enormous amounts of power going forward on every scenario. We can debate the numbers later, and data centers, are going to be consuming a lot more power. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked with other speakers on how you get the power, the grid, uh, what kind of energy can produce them, nuclear or other things, but here we're really right focused in your wheelhouse, the data center and efficiency. So let's start with that. Can you give us a bit of uh, context and how do we think about this problem? If you look at it at the, uh, at the unit size of the big data center, the hyperscaling data center, mm -hmm. um, how much can we do to improve the efficiency of that data center? What tools do you have at your disposal? Yeah, so, so just to put this in perspective, overall when we talk about these data centers, the size of data centers is changing dramatically. Mm -hmm. It used to be five, 10 megawatt type of data centers. We're talking about half a gigawatt type of data centers and sometimes even bigger than that, right? Now, the need for energy, while it is going up dramatically, the efficiency of the systems which build these data centers is also increasing multifold. So I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples on, on real products. Uh, as an example, in the powertrain, we have <coughs> products like the GVXL UPSs, which is a very specific example. The reason it is much better for the need of energy now is because the footprint is much smaller, the efficiency is much larger, and it's AI ready. So which means you can put in a product in the entire powertrain, and you still need energy, but much lesser energy, and you can still meet the AI demand. So that's just one example. The other way to think about it is when you look at even the cooling systems. Mm -hmm. Now, in the past, it was always about conventional cooling. You put in a lot of water, et cetera, in there. In the newer technologies, which is in liquid cooling, you have a closed loop. So you're not utilizing the same amount of water. You're, uting, you, you're just filling the system up once and then just as keeps running. You only probably need to replenish once in a few months a small little amount of water. So those are some specific examples. Uh, I can understand why that spares the water, but how does that help me with the cooling? Is it actually a better cooling system? It is actually a better cooling system. So just basic physics, air can only take out so much of heat. Mm -hmm. Now when you think about the heat which is getting generated in these data centers, Currently, most of the inference, as you call it, data centers have five to 10 kilowatt in a single rack. With these new technologies, with these new super chips, the amount of compute capability goes up dramatically. We are already talking about up to 30, 40, 50 kilowatt per rack. Now, the, the way, where, it, where the pivot point happens is at around 30, 40 kilowatt per rack, you cannot use air anymore because air is not capable to take out that heat. It's very, very inefficient. That's where you need to use liquid cooling. So when liquid cooling comes into, when you look at direct to chip, which is one of the main technologies, there are right. others out there. Right. Yeah. So, so th that's w the one of the primary reasons why we have to use liquid cooling. So, um, and in fact, if I'm not mistaken, you're in the process of acquiring, uh, pending regulatory approval, uh, uh, an innovative cooling company in America. Is that right? Yes. Yes, that's correct. And look, this company is called Motivair. Uh, we've, we've made the bid and it's in the process of approvals. We should be able to do it very, very quickly. But the important, more than that, the important part is that this is a company which has been in this space of liquid cooling for almost two decades. And for the last 10 years, one of the key component of liquid cooling, which is called the CDU, the cooling distribution unit, they've installed over 2,000 of those CDUs in the United States and in a few other countries. So they have a lot of experience and they've done all of that in the supercompute environment, right. which is extremely important when you think about these size data centers with very high level of uh, compute capability. Now, th th this kind of uh, advanced technology for cooling has been used by NASA, has been used, uh, of course, yes. in these very yeah. uh, elaborate supercomputing systems. For this to be uh, practical and economical, yes. Yes. At uh, you know widespread and dispersed as we're going to see these data centers everywhere, yes. we're going to need something of a, a revolution, aren't we, in, in sort of the commercialization of this technology? It needs scale. You, you, you pointed very well, Vijay, it needs scale. So as a company, what we're trying to do is, one is, of course, Motivare, but we have our own cooling facilities, some of which you will see <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, what we do there is, in those facilities, we have already built in the capability to expand them and be able to build most of these CDUs. 
And then we have built new f newer factories. We're making a lot of investment these days. We're making new factories, another one which we built in India, which can also make thousands of CDUs. So scale is what is needed. And by the way, it's not just that because you're bringing such an important point. It, it is also about the expertise to install these units. So there's a lot of work which is happening in skills development for the kind of people you're needing to be able to go install these properly. I mean, let's not make a mistake. This is now you're putting water inside the white space of a data center. Right. It's different from in the in the past or today. We just have in the in the white space data center. You have digital, which is d data cables, and you have power. Now you're also bringing a third angle, which is water. So it needs a very special expertise, and that's why we're very confident with the motivator capability. Now we've seen um, uh, optimism expressed by uh, the companies promoting uh, chips. Uh, Jensen's law has been promoted, uh, including on getting much more efficient. Uh, from the perspective that you come at it, um, you, in a sense, work on the balance of plant. You sort of make the uh, power in as well as the uh, heat out work. Um, yeah. uh, what do you see in terms of the uh, limitations? Is there a, a power law from uh, the balance of plant that you work on? I know you have a, a recent deal announced just, I think, uh, or announcement this week uh, with NVIDIA for yeah. a more efficient design. Can you tell us a little bit about that yeah. and, and what that means for the bigger question of are there limits to how far you can go, or do you see a lot of runway? So, so uh, again, if you take a step back, you have power and you have cooling. The limitations on power in terms of voltages, there's no challenge right now. Cooling, we already discussed the liquid cooling part, so that solves that problem. But it's very really important to work with companies like NVIDIA for us because they are defining the future of compute. With the future of compute, the amount of power needed, the data needed, the amount of cooling needed, that eventually has to go onto the physical layer of the data center, which is what we do, right? We build those data centers. Hence, what we do with them is work on their future plans and build up reference architectures for building these data centers. Actually, what we are talking about is yesterday what we launched was with NVIDIA, we have come up with three real examples of reference architectures. We've gone up to 132 kilowatt per rack. I know it, I don't want to get too technical, but 132 kilowatt per rack compared to like five to 10 today, mm -hmm. it's multiples. It's, it's just multiples. The entire power train, the busways, the cooling systems, everything is different. And why do you need multiple uh, blueprints? Um, uh, I think uh, earlier in the year, I think, uh, uh, an affiliate of, of Google Sidewalk Infrastructure Partners put out one template, and they're building a couple of models of much more efficient data centers that they yeah. think is the way forward. Yeah. Uh, why do you need three? Simply because you have AI training clusters, and then you have inference clusters. Training clusters are very, very high density. Inference clusters are lesser density. The physical infrastructure need to build those data center changes when you go f to a very high density, which is 130 kilowatt, of, and actually even more, right. or if it is smaller. So that's why you need multiple. I and then see. there are hybrid, by the way. There, okay. there, there'll be data centers which will do both. I see. Um, the last point I want to end on, and that is um, a point that came up in uh, the plenary today, that is um, uh, looking to data centers, which at the moment are a source of a problem for the energy system, uh, but could they become a source of solutions as well by being a source of flexibility? Yeah. The argument was made that um, given the intermittency of renewables that are flourishing on the grid, being in part paid for by big tech companies that want to see clean firm power, uh, that we may, uh, could data centers themselves provide flexibility perhaps by shifting load uh, temporally or spatially? Uh, what's the reality of that? There's a big debate here among the technical experts that are present. Yeah, so, so there are two points to that. First of all, given the availability of the type of sources, can the data centers take these multiple sources? So we, at Schneider, we are building those technologies. So that means you can have a data center which can take the kind of source from the grid or from renewable or from wherever else mm -hmm. at any point of time and then rebalance it for the load which is compute, right? So that's possible. The other thing is, can you share? No, sorry, is that through energy storage or what's the buffer or software? En en energy storage is one piece of it, yeah. but there are, there are more pieces that you, you could create a whole platform which right. takes from energy storage, which mm -hmm. takes from a microgrid, it could take from renewable, it could take from SMR, if possible, it could take from the conventional grid, et cetera. I see. So that's, that's the whole technology platform which right. is there, right? And it has both hardware and software inside. But the second aspect also which is important is, can you share this back with the grid? That's the challenge. And that's where the challenge is, simply because the uptime need for these compute capability is so high that you don't want to be sharing it back, but what if when you need it, you don't have it, right? right. So that's a debate in the industry which is still on, and, and, and the hyperscalers are completely involved in this, and we are working with them closely, but there's still not a very clear answer to that. All right, so we'll have to watch this space. Yes. Um, <laughs> that's all the time we have, I'm afraid, but that's been fascinating. Thank you for joining us. This conversation, live from the IEA's Global Energy and AI Conference in Paris, will be available for a replay on the IEA's website. 
And up next, I'll have a, a final conversation uh, with a surprise guest you'll see in a moment. So I hope you'll come back and join us. Thank you. Thank you.